A former Nevada Democratic legislator is accusing former Vice President Joe Biden of unwanted touching before a campaign event in 2014. Lucy Flores detailed the allegations in an essay titled, An Awkward Kiss Changed How I Saw Joe Biden. She said, quote, I had never experienced anything so blatantly inappropriate and unnerving before. Biden responded in a statement on Sunday. He said in part, quote, in my many years on the campaign trail and in public life, I've offered countless handshakes, hugs, expressions of affection, support and comfort. Not once, never did I believe I acted inappropriately. Earlier today, I asked Flores if Biden's response was sufficient. I don't believe so, because first and foremost, I, I really need him to acknowledge that that behavior was inappropriate. Um, in any context or any situation with that context, that behavior is just inappropriate, period. And, and he doesn't go as far as acknowledging that. Um, second, I think that, you know, in terms of when he talks about his motivation, et cetera, we really need to also acknowledge that it's not, it's not about the intent. It is about the person on the receiving end of that behavior, that unwanted behavior, and, and the way in which it makes that person feel, especially, especially in a situation where you have that kind of a power imbalance going on. You have the second most powerful person in the country, arguably one of the most powerful men in the entire world, and, and someone who does not have that kind of power, a woman who does not have that kind of power. And you have to, you have to be aware of the kind of um, influence and the kind of presence as a powerful man that you have over others. And joining me now are Joel Payne and Caitlin Huey Burns. Joel is a Democratic strategist, and Caitlin is a CBSN political reporter. Welcome to you both. Caitlin, let me start with you. Do these allegations, do you think, will they impact Biden's, uh, Biden's decision on whether or not to run? Well, I think that it paints a picture for Biden of a Democratic Party that is very different from the one he has long been a part of. And I mean, the way in which the politics of Me Too have changed the party over the past two years or so. Uh, Biden has been weighing a run. He's been toying with it. He's been lingering, really. Uh, we know that he wants to run for president, but these kinds of things, uh, the additional layers of scrutiny that are applied to him, not only on his behavior, but also on his record. Remember, earlier last week, he was having to kind of apologize for his handling of the Anita, uh, Anita Hill testimony. He was chair of the Judiciary Committee at the time. Uh, this is this shows kind of the dangers of waiting around. He right. doesn't have a campaign up and running. He's having to respond to these kinds of questions. You can argue the legitimacy or, uh, you know, on the, on the, the value of, um, a, of, of allegations. And you have had several women who have worked with Biden closely, who have come forward and said they support him and that this isn't the behavior that they've seen. Right. But if you are still thinking about a campaign and you're actually getting ready to launch one, as we know, he has said later this month he would probably... This is not the kind of environment that you want to have before making that that big announcement. I can't help but feel this also highlights the dangers of being in politics so long, actually. Right. You have the experience on the one hand, but on the other hand, the times, they are a-changing, you exactly. know? Exactly. And, and on policy as mm -hmm. well. Uh, there are, are critics of the former vice president uh, on various policy issues, and the party has moved. Uh, he is still very popular within the party. He was the vice president for a very popular Democratic president. Uh, so people respond to that in polling and they like him. And from my own reporting, I can say that a lot of voters I've talked to love him so much, they almost don't want him to run because they don't want him to go through this process and potentially damage a legacy that they are in favor of. Right. So I also asked Lucy Flores if she would support Biden in the primary and in general. And here's what she said, Joel. So in the context of, the enti of his entire history, yes, the, he's not someone I would support in the primary. Right. And now that's going, to be, that's going to be a decision that everybody else is going to have to make in terms of whether or not, um, given the totality of everything that he has done, if they believe that it's someone they want to support in the Democratic primary if he gets in. Let me ask you something. If he were to be the Democratic nominee and he's up against Donald Trump, whose own history with women is, as, as we know, pretty clouded, who would you support in that kind of a matchup? That's not even a question. Of course I would support Biden. 
So, Joel, what's your reaction to that? Biden versus Trump. She would support Biden, of course. So uh, what do you make of how Biden has handled all of this? Well, look, I think the most recent statement from the vice president uh, was a lot more on point and with the times and with what the expectations would be of what you would expect him to say. He was very much uh, he, he took a, a, a big step towards validating Ms. Flores' claims, although it didn't quite go far enough for her, um, his first statement. Not that it was flip, but certainly did not give the veracity to, to her claims that the second statement did. But I, I look at this in a bigger context. This is the Democratic Party that exists right now, and this is about the standard that Democrats have set. This is the party that ran out Al Franken, okay? This is a party that, uh, you know, really harangued Brett Kavanaugh last fall. And Democrats have said and have established this is the standard. This is this is what we expect out of our public servants. This is the standard we hold the other party to. I think the problem a lot of Democrats have is we're the only ones playing by the rule, where it's like you've got two teams on a baseball field and one of them's playing by AL rules and one of them's playing by NL rules. Right. And Democrats are trying to figure out whether or not they're getting played by, by holding themselves to these super high standards. And Republicans clearly have decided they are not, given who is in the White House. Well, Joel, of course, you know, the Democrat Party is the progressive party, so of course it's going to be at the forefront of any sort of progressive issue, and therefore it's going to have more candidates who are going to have to sort of answer to those issues than the Republicans. I think, I, I think that's, the, frankly, though, that's the, so a lot of Democrats would say, is the Senate a more progressive place without Al Franken? Right. Okay. Is, is is the cause of women's rights better without Al Franken? I I, I am not in a position to answer that for everybody, mm -hmm. but I think that's an open question that Democrats are going to answer through this process, and it's going to be litigated through Biden. It's going to be litigated through the candidates that are up. You have a record number of women candidates running, and women's and minority issues are front and center, uh, really as early in the primary cycles we've ever seen. Right. All right. Now, a few 2020 candidates have reacted to the allegations against Biden. Here's what's some of them had to say. I believe Lucy Flores and Joe Biden needs to give an answer. Should he not run as a result? Look, that's for Joe Biden to decide. I, I believe um, Lucy Flores. We need to live in a nation where people can hear her truth. I have no reason not to believe Lucy. Well, I think that's a decision for the vice president to make. I'm not sure that one incident uh, alone disqualifies uh, anybody. But her point is absolutely right. So, Caitlin, we see the Democratic candidates there are hesitating in t whether or not mm -hmm. to say Biden should not run over this. Do they need to take a stronger stance? Well, you're hearing, I believe her, as the refrain from these 2020 candidates. And to pick up on something Joel just made, which I think is a really important point about Democrats having set that standard, that moral high ground, as they like to claim, now they're seeing the pushback from that or the backlash, perhaps, within their own party. We're seeing it on Biden now, and there are some Democrats who are saying, well, isn't there some kind of gray area? Things aren't as finite. Uh, and Biden himself is, is defending this behavior is not the same as some others who have been swept into uh, this, this movement. Uh, what I think Democrats are doing is they want to not reject Joe Biden. And we've seen that already before uh, these allegations came out, that Democrats were welcoming him into the field. But it's important to note that he has not cleared the field in any way. In fact, you're seeing so many candidates already in the race and lots raising a lot of money. So there were factors that could have served as a deterrent to Biden actually getting into the race before this came out. Out. Right. The policy issues that we talked about, the fundraising, the idea that there are so many kind of newcomers in this field already and candidate or voters are having an opportunity to look at these candidates. This is a these are mounting challenges for Biden and this is just adding to that. And let's move on to one of those newcomers that's getting a lot of attention. Uh, I want to turn now to a different Democratic 2020 hopeful, South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg. He announced today that his exploratory committee has raised an estimated seven million dollars. Joel, what do you think this means for his chances if he declares officially? Well, what it means is that he is here to stay. 
Um, I think for a lot of these candidates, look, so you have your first tier, your people like Kamala Harris, uh, the aforementioned Joe Biden, uh, Bernie Sanders, that, that top tier that you know are going to be there in the end. They're going to be there through the early states, through Super Tuesday. They're established. They're going to have an infrastructure and a pipeline. For people like Pete Buttigieg, that was not guaranteed. So essentially, I think his performance through this first quarter, both financially and every opportunity he's been in front of voters, has demonstrated he is going to be here for the long run. He's somebody who's a factor, he's got a place in this field, and he's going to influence this race. Now, a former campaign advisor for Hillary Clinton slammed Buttigieg recently for comments he made in The Washington Post magazine two months ago when he said, quote, Donald Trump got elected because, in his twisted way, he pointed out the huge troubles in our economy and our democracy. At least he didn't go around saying that America was already great, like Hillary did. Now, he partially walked back the comments this weekend, saying he has enormous respect for Hillary. But, Caitlin, I want to ask you this. Could criticizing Hillary Clinton help Buttigieg or hurt him? I don't think it'll really hurt him. I think you're seeing a lot of people who worked for Hillary Clinton and supported her in 2016 say, look, she did talk about policy a lot. She talked about other things, and they just didn't break through as Trump kind of saturated the market in the 2016 campaign. So they're right to have this defense of her. Uh, Buttigieg, though, is making a generational argument here. He is the only millennial candidate, the first millennial candidate running for president. He's saying that, look, people his age, I think he's 37, mm -hmm. uh, grew up in an economy that never worked for them, grew up with a government that really never uh, got, got along with each other involved in uh, foreign wars for uh, big parts of, of his life. He was a veteran, of course, as well, saying, look, we need a seat at the table and we're bringing some new ideas to the field. And you're seeing uh, a positive response within the party to that. I think those numbers tell uh, are a testament to that idea. So whether or not he goes the long run, at least right now, you're seeing an energy in the party for some fresh ideas and fresh faces, especially after 2016, when there were not a lot of choices for Democrats. Right. Here, you have a very different field. All right. Tanya, I was Tanya. I was one of those Democrats, actually, uh, that commented on that. And I used to work for Hillary Clinton. And I will say this, you know, Democrats have to figure out a way to move on from the, from the aftermath of 2016 mm -hmm. while still honoring Hillary Clinton's sacrifice. And I know that that's a feeling, by the way, in an era where you are going to see women's issues, again, as we discussed, and the idea of electing a woman president be more important this cycle than probably it's ever been. I do not think it is good politics for any of these Democratic contenders to make Hillary Clinton their hobby horse. Right. It's fine to, it's fine to, you know, I said this a few weeks ago with the Amy Klobuchar issue when she talked about going to certain states. It's okay to do a better job than the Hillary Clinton campaign and to point that out. What's not okay is to invalidate her record of service. That is not going to be met well by a lot of Democrats, regardless of who you support. I would agree with that. I think a lot of Democratic women t as well. All right, Joel Payne and Caitlin Huey-Burns, thanks to both of you for being with us.